Welcome to the Layman Seminary. What I'm going to be doing in this video is I'm preparing for my debate with uh, David Preston, the guy that you see on the right side in this video. And uh, we're actually going to be debating the same topic. The difference is, is that C.J. Cox was from the reform perspective, and I'm the free grace dispensational perspective, or for some of y'all out there, just simply OSAS, which I believe is the most consistent form of OSAS. Well, anyway, what I want to do in this video is I've made this PowerPoint uh, several weeks ago, I think, whenever I first found out about the debate and I started preparing for that. I can't remember the videos that I made concerning that. Well, I had intended at that time to, to restart my dispensation series around that time because this is related to that. So some of this may be uploaded as that as well. But anyway, what I want to do in this is I'm just going to walk myself or walk y'all through the PowerPoint that I've made a long time ago as it's interacting with David Preston's argument from that video. And so this is going to help me formulate a response to him, both my opening and interaction and stuff. This is a very challenging debate uh, because I'm not an expert in uh, hyper grace or ultra dispensationalist, whatever term you want to use. And so um, it's definitely a challenge for me. It's a different kind of challenge than my first debate, but I'll talk to you about comparison and contrast to that later on. So as you see from this title, the debate there was where the Israelites saved by faith plus works under the Old Testament. And basically, that's the same question that, that uh, we're going to be answering. I say, no, they were not saved by faith plus works in the Old Testament. He's going to say yes, I guess. So the burden of proof is on him in that area. Now, this is just a reminder that in one of my videos called Final Destiny, I go through the four types of salvation in and the Exodus events. So you got national positional salvation, temporal national salvation, temporal individual salvation, and individual positional salvation. And uh, I talk about eight different events here. I've done this in a paper and uh, uh, it's beneficial. It may turn into a journal article at some point, but I may have to argue from some of this stuff to explain how I see salvation. I'm not sure yet. So this event has already occurred. Um, this was uh, International uh, Biblical Hermeneutic Society. Can't remember the exact way the acronym goes. But they were calling for uh, papers and the and the and the stuff related to straw men and debates. Well, none of them was about uh, teaching multiple ways of salvation, which I wish it was, because that would have helped me prepare for this. And I'm going to go back and relook at that information and see if there's anything I can use. But my point is, if you're a dispensationalist, I think you should be aware of what's going on in dispensationalism. Dispensationalism is not stuck with uh, Schofield. It's not stuck with Darby. It's not stuck with Schaefer, stuck with Ryrie, or even Elliot Johnson. There's constant discussions at the Dis Council of Dispensational Hermeneutics. All of these issues are, are, are brought up. In fact, in the last one that I was in, there was actually a mid-acts dispensationalist. I think that's the term they prefer rather than hyper-dispensationalist, who was free grace. I think his name was Timothy Gord. But anyway, I just want people to realize that this is academic. Uh, dispensationalism a lot of times is is mischaracterized, uh, characterized, characterized, actually, made like a cartoon. And uh, um, I'm here to try to represent the truth of that. Sadly, there are some people that have gotten things wrong for whatever reason. I'm not saying I got everything right, but I'm going to work towards getting things right. Okay, so in David Preston's first slide, he starts talking about what is the Old Testament. Well, I don't know what Schofield says yet on this page. We'll look in a minute. But uh, what is the Old Testament? I know the debates about what is the Old Testament, but actually whenever he's saying the Old Testament, he's referring to Mosaic Covenant, where most people that will be preparing for the debate are going to think about, you know, everything in Genesis as well. 
But my understanding is that Preston wants to narrow things down to the Mosaic Covenant. Now, you typically hear this uh, threefold division of the Mosaic Covenant, the moral law, the civil law, and the ceremonial law. And some people will argue that the, the, sec the second one and the third one were done away with by Christ's sacrifice at the cross, but the moral law wasn't. The problem you have with that is that you have the Sabbath included in that. Well, the guy that I'm debating is not a Sabbatarian, so we don't have to go into that. Okay. Now, he's saying, what purpose did the law serve? Now, I got my notes here. I can mark up things. All right. The law was added because of transgressions. I to give, give to sin the character of transgression. It's true that the law helps you better understand exactly the way that you are sinful. I mean, you can know that you're a sinner, but if some, if you can know the more specifics of it, like what ways. So there's that aspect. I, so I have no problem with that statement. Men have been sinning before Moses, that's true, but in absence of law, their sins were not put to their account. Uh, I kind of think this is a misunderstanding of this passage. But I don't know if I have a better understand uh, a better alternative to demonstrate here. So I probably won't contest this issue. The law gave to sin the character of transgression, i.e., personal guilt. You know, some of this imputation language and guilt language and inherited sin, you know, it's kind of debated even in free grace now. Um, I usually go with the traditional arguments, but I'm open to others. Also, since men not only continued to transgress after the law was given, but were provoked to transgress by the very ball that forbade it. Uh, provoking, I've written a paper on Romans 7. I think I've used better language there, but, but I understand that idea. The law is not sinful, and the law does not tempt anybody. However, it, it does expose a person, and you could say it exaggerates sin, you know, like salt in the wound, but I, I don't I don't know. I would have to go back and look at my Roman stuff and see if that, that could be beneficial for this paper. The law, therefore, concluded all under sin. So all under the penalty of sin. Uh, that's how that would be described as. Okay. The law was an ad interim deal until the seed should come. Yeah, it was temporary. The law shut sinful man up to faith as the only avenue of, of escape. Well, I've done a paper on Galatians 3, and I can't remember exactly how I understood the word shut up. I think I meant like in prison, but there was another way that I understood this. So just going through this, I can think about, okay, I, I have other papers that I can pull things from if I need to. The law was to the Jews what the pedagogue or the teacher or trainer was in a Greek household, a rule of children in their minority, and it had this character unto Christ, Galatians 3.24. Once again, that's from my Galatians 3 pastor. Christ having come, the believer is no longer under the pedagogy. Well, technically, my view of this, this is only talking about Israel. And so when it talks about the seed to come and all of this, this is not talking about Gentiles. This is talking about the theocracy, how the Mosaic Covenant was the rule of life, the code, in operation, the constitution, if you will, and the legislative and judicial aspect of, of God's will for the theocracy during this time. So I don't think that this is a reference to the Gentile. Okay, um, because of, for the sake, i.e. in order that sin might be made manifest transgression, those passages are mentioned. And then he's got the Schofield reference note we could go look at okay let me clear that he brought up this chart of the of uh this is from larkin i think and about the the way he looks at the covenants and stuff and he's basically arguing what the mosaic law is so notice according to this you have the moses and you have the legal dispensation which is called the law and then you have Jesus and Calvary. And so he, he's calling all of that the Mosaic Covenant. Well, Moses and Mount Sinai beginning it, you know, so there's that aspect. I'm not sure why Larkin began the law here. Maybe because he was showing that they had to be in the land. 
right here. But uh, um, anyway, if he goes with this route, which he probably will, just out of his love of dispensationalism and these older, older dispensationalists, then he's not really telling me anything. He's telling the audience something because I am a dispensationalist, so that's not a problem. Um, how was the Israelites saved under the Old Testament? And what he means by Old Testament, again, is Mosaic Law. So let's get our annotator. One believed that one had to obey and keep the law of Moses in order that one might be righteous before God. This is true. But the issue is, is what kind of righteous in view? For those that already know my chart, right? You got position, you got experience, and you got ultimate. Position is how you're saved. Experience is your walk. And ultimate is when you get a glorified body. Now, I believe that anyone throughout time of human history, when they believe God... And, and the required, required revelation that he gave to them, then they were they received righteousness for that. Okay? And, and this righteousness was imputed to them. It wasn't their own. But the type of righteousness this is talking about, I place right here. This is what I call practical righteousness, ethical righteousness or experiential righteousness in other words this is the believer's walk when a believer is in fellowship with god and does things according to his word and in his strength then that is credited to him as righteousness in other words god believes that that act is rewardable it has eternal value okay so if this statement right here refers to experiential righteous i totally agree but this also now i'm gonna have to clear this to explain this see i view most people whenever they're talking about covenants this is how most people view covenants they put them right here they put them in the positional category and they make them salvific because of that and that's why some people that believe you can lose your salvation get so confused when it comes to aspects of covenants. But when you study the, how the covenants are used in the Bible, as well as how they're used in the ancient Near East, you find out that they're based off of uh, a suzerain vassal treaty, a relationship, a master-servant relationship. And even the land grants that possibly the, the Abrahamic covenant is given was still given by a suzerain, either as a reward or as a gift. So what this means is that the primary idea behind the covenants is not salvation, it's service, worship, and fellowship. And I have videos where I break down the covenants in more detail. So... Once again, because we're dealing with a covenant we're, and we're dealing with uh, this type of righteousness by obeying and keeping the law, I believe this is experiential sanctification. Now, it could be argued that if you believed the salvation content that is in the Mosaic law, whatever that may be, um, then keeping the law would include getting saved. Um, but there's a couple differences about that. You know, like, for example... I believe the salvation is based on believing God. Okay. Believing God. And you can say his provision, his promises, whatever it may be that he reveals that a person needed to believe to be saved. All right. Now, the row of sacrifices confuses some people and I'm still working on articulating this but basically when you brought a sacrifice it's because you believed God wanted you to even if you're in the theocracy and, and you were an unbeliever you believed that God established that uh, theocracy I don't really think there was a such thing as an atheist back then um, so they probably believed in God they probably questioned whether it was the one true God, you know, that aspect of things. 
or whether there was a more powerful God than him or something like that, or whether he was worthy of worship. You know, there could be reasons why someone was an unbeliever living in theocracy. Um, but so it's not the sacrifice that brings about positional salvation. It's belief in God and whatever that content was. Okay. So he gives us an example from Luke 1, 5 and 6. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias. Zacharias is already a believer of the course of Bia, and his wife was a daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. She's a believer for what I know. And they were both righteous before God. Now, when he's reading this, he's seeing the word righteous, and then he sees this. Walking, because this looks like a participle, explaining this. Walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And so he's basically trying to say, look, in the book of Luke, which is underneath the Mosaic Law, even though it was written during the church age, it's talking about that time, you have an example of someone that's called righteous. And the reason they're called righteous is because they're walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. Well, I'm, I agree with them. They are righteous. But this is experiential righteousness. See, he is erring when he's thinking that that it's positional righteousness and therefore what he's saying is that because we're not become righteous by doing commandments and ordinances and stuff then uh they had to be saved some other way salvation by faith plus works but that that's not the case you know um and i i think that's where he errs Let's go forward. Considerations. Let me go back to red. The Holy Spirit didn't regenerate anyone or reside in individuals permanently. I agree with this permanent indwelling. I agree. There was not a permanent indwelling. Far as about did not regenerate anyone. This may not necessarily be so um you know the thing is is that he's basically saying that you're not saved unless unless you re uh, receive the spirit but this kind of works against the argument it kind of confuses me because wait a minute are you arguing that they were saved by faith plus works or are you arguing that they couldn't be saved because regeneration didn't occur and so he gave some examples of the temporary selective indwelling, if you will, or being upon them, actually, anointing idea or filling idea, maybe, upon Saul, Job, Samson, Balaam, the false prophets. People's names could be taken out of the book of life, but he didn't explain what the book of life was. And, and with Moses, the book of life was physical life. And I don't know yet, 69, what it is, but it can refer to uh rewards as well especially in the new testament so that's an option forgiveness of sins can only come by all's given or forgiven as other first okay so whenever you go look at the old testament mosaic law there's several statements that talk about how forgiveness of sin comes through the sacrifices so by him reducing it to alms given i think that's reductionistic and um and saying forgiven others first I think this is dealing with one specific aspect of sin. I mean, and, and the offering that deals with it. I don't think it's addressing everything. Now, you notice he's bringing up New Testament passages. And he thinks he can do that because uh, it's talking about the Mosaic Covenant because Jesus is teaching underneath the Mosaic Covenant. Now, he says right here, the righteous dead went to Abraham's bosom. So this makes me think, okay, you're recognizing that people could be saved. So it's like, you don't believe they're regenerated anyone, okay? And you don't believe they're permanent and dwelling. And you think that salvation is by faith plus works. But yet you think there are actually people that were saved because they went to Abram's bosom, the righteous dead. 
or is what he meaning that these people did righteous acts and therefore they got an opportunity to get saved when Christ supposedly preached to them at some other point um, and uh, after the resurrection or after his death. You could look, okay, look what he says here. You could lose your salvation under the Old Testament. So if that be the case, then the only way you could become a righteous dead would be, be persevering. So it makes me wonder if he held your perseverance of the saints for the Old Testament. And we can look at these passages and see, but I think all of them are dealing with physical death. Um, but we'll look eventually. Under the Old Testament, one could establish their own righteous by keeping the law. Yeah, experiential righteousness. Nothing wrong with that concept. That's not talking about how you're positionally saved. All right, moving forward. So then he uses this passage. Levi 18.5 You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments. With a man do, he shall live in them. Now there are times in the past of scripture where it connects a command to actually physically living. There won't be underneath divine discipline. But living in this sense also relates to quality of life and blessings as it relates to the covenant. So, um, but he's taking this to refer to positional salvation. I would put it in the experiential sanctification column. Okay. So this is where I start diving into some of the stuff he quotes. He quotes John Gill, okay? Who's a reform guy? Maybe the reason he was quoting a reform guy because he was debating a reform guy. So we'll just read what's on the page and talk about it. All right. Um, it says, um, "Live which he shall live in them. Live a long life in the land of Canaan, in in great happiness and prosperity." See Deuteronomy thirty. For as for eternal life, that was never intended to be had, nor was it possible to be had and enjoyed by obedience to the law, which fallen man is unable to keep, but it was what was graciously promised and provided in the covenant of grace. Okay, there's a reformed language right there. Before the world was come through Christ as a free gift to all believe him. Then this was his point of quoting this guy, that even though he doesn't believe, the way Preston believes, he was honest enough to quote this statement, though some Jewish writers interpret this of eternal life as Jarchi, Abin Ezra, and Ben Gershop, I am the Lord that has enjoyed these statutes and judges to promise life to the doers of them, able and faithful to perform what is promised. Well, I mean, just looking at that statement the way it is, it never says that that was for salvation. Now, he's going to give some other stuff later on, but this may be too early, uh, or, or this may not be strong enough, but he's telling me to go into extra biblical literature to examine these things, okay? So he's appealing to extra biblical literature. All right, so this brings me to Charles Ellicott, which he also quoted. And here's the quote for them. Better he shall live for them. Better he shall live by or through them. That is by observing them, the law abiding will live a happy and prosperous life since disobedience will expose the offender to the penalty of death. But this is physical death. The spiritual authorities in the time of the second temple interpret this clause to mean he who obeys these laws shall have eternal life. Hence, the ancient Chaldee version translates it shall have life eternal. This, all right, so we got a textual variant issue there. This passage is quoted both in the prophets and by St. Paul, who contrasts his promise made to works with the promise of the gospel made to faith. And so we have that there. So basically what he's trying to do is he's trying to show the Second Temple Judaism believed this. 
And then he's going to argue further that it was the belief of the Old Testament saints, if you want to call them saints. I don't know if they were saved or not. Kind of confusing based on what I'm reading. The Companion Bible, which this guy, Bullinger, formed uh, or founded ultra dispensationalism, if you will, in Britain. So this is what he says concerning this area. Live. Live again in resurrection life. Revelation 25. The Chaldee paraphrase shall live by them to eternal life. So Jarchi. So they're all saying the same reference, right? Live in a world that is to come. But this can even be sounded like a reward idea, which I think there are places in the New Testament that relates that idea. Other passages where live is used in this sense. In this sense, the verb is used more than that is generally thought. The spiritual authorities of the second temple so interpreted this phrase, thus eternal life by faith is set in contrast with eternal life by works. Or the word life is not referring to um, being saved. It's referring to the quality of life, the abundant life that one will have uh, in this life or in the next. In the millennial kingdom. Okay, so we're going forward. Now, this is where we start to get into some of the rabbinical stuff. Okay, um, Leviticus. This is from this is what Rashi says. You shall keep my laws and my rules. This apparent repetition extends the obligation to all of the details not explicitly mentioned in the passage that follows. Another reading, the repetition shows that both doing and keeping apply to both the laws and the rules, though keeping is applied in verse 4. Only to the laws and do unto the rules. By the pursuit of which a man shall live in the world to come. For it cannot refer to this world in which, after all, everyone must die. So, I mean, the world to come, I would take that to be the Messianic Millennial Kingdom. So I don't think this is necessarily a, a, a salvation passage. I am the Lord. I could be relied on you to give you your reward. Notice that statement there about your reward. Okay. A better solution is simply acknowledge just as there are two kinds of inheritance, two dimensions of salvation, so there are two sides to eternal life. I think this is from Dillo. It is commonly recognized that Ionios, eternal when associated with life, includes more than unending existence. The lexicon of Luonida, for example, says... Uh, uh, in combination with Zoe, there's every not only a temporal element, but also a qualitative distinction. In those cases, they suggest that the idea of real life be included in the translation. All right, so that's mentioned in that. And here's the Luonida lexicon of semantic domains. And this is what it says concerning that. Pertaining to unlimited duration of time, eternal. And this is the most frequent use of Ionios in the New Testament is with Zoe like. For example, Hina Pasa Pasuon in Ato Eke Zoen Ionion. So that is that everyone believeth in him have eternal life. So that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. In combination with Zoe, there's everything not only a temporal element, but also a qualitative distinction. In such context, Ionios evidently carries certain implications associated with Ionios in relationship to divine and supernatural attributes. If one translates eternal life as simply never dying, there may be serious misunderstandings since persons may assume that never dying refers only to physical existence rather than the spiritual death. Accordingly, some translations have rendered eternal life as unending real life so as to introduce a qualitative distinction. Okay. So this lexicon is supporting this idea of quantity and qualitative. Under the article, the related Greek noun ion, Gert comments, the word eternal here indicates a definite quality. It is a different life from the old existence, typified by hate, lack of love, sin, pain, and death. And this is the new uh, dictionary, New Testament. I can't remember uh, all the acronym for that. All right, so we, okay, so this is a different one. More than this, you'll get the regeneration. It is a dynamic relationship with Christ himself, which grows and increases in richness as we take up our cross daily, deny ourselves, and follow him. Jesus taught us about the dynamic relationship when he said, 
Now this is eternal life, Zoe Aonios, that you may that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you sent. Advancing this dynamic dimension of eternal life is what Jesus referred to as saving one soul. He explained elsewhere that this life was intended to grow and become more abundant. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. But growth is not automatic. It is conditioned on our response. Only by the exercise of spiritual disciplines such as prayer, community with other believers, personal worship, obedience, faith, study scriptures, and proper response trials does our intimacy with Christ increase. Okay, this is what Apostle Paul referred to when he challenged Timothy to take hold of eternal life. So this is 1 Timothy 6.12. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called when you, when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Now, my opponent will argue that salvation in the church age is by grace, but before then it was faith plus works. But here's in 1 Timothy using the term take hold of eternal life. Now, I understand this to refer to uh, the reward aspect of things, but I'm, I'm curious to find out how he interprets it. But I won't be the one that I know of that will um, bring the bring the arguments outside of the Mosaic Covenant. It will typically probably be him that does it. Okay, possessing eternal life is one thing in the sense of initial entrance, but taking hold of it is another. The former is static. The latter is dynamic. The former depends on God. The latter depends on us. The former comes through faith alone. Taking hold requires faith plus keeping commandments. So, I mean, this passage could be helpful because if this correct understanding is correct, then the distinction that this man is trying to make between uh, faith plus works in the Old Testament and, and faith plus works in the New Testament doesn't hold water. Now, of course, I don't believe the salvation was ever by faith plus works. But what I want to argue is that these passages that he thinks are referring to faith plus works are actually uh, spiritual sanctification passages, not a reference to how to be saved. Those who are rich in the world and who give generously will lay up treasures of themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Eternal life is not only the gift of regeneration, it is also true life that is cultivated by faith in acts of obedience. Israel was instructed in this matter. This is from Deuteronomy 4.1. Hear now, O Israel, the decrees and the laws I'm about to teach you. Follow them so that you may live and may go and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you. Okay? Like I said, this is physical life, but it's more than that. It means live with purpose, live in fulfillment, receiving the blessings uh, of the covenant, those things like that. A similar thought is expressed in Leviticus 18.5, where the Israelites are told, Keep my decrees in law, for the man who bathes them will live by them. I am the Lord. As long as you remember that eternal life is fundamentally a quality of life in relationship to God, this should not cause us any difficulty with the numerous passages of stress that justification is by faith alone. Okay. In Galatians 6, 8, 9, for example, eternal life is something earned by the sower. The one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap correction, corruption, but the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. If this passage is speaking of final salvation from eternal damnation, then salvation is based on works, which we know it's not. If we sow to please the Spirit, we will reap future chance eternal life. Paul calls it a harvest if we do not lose heart in doing good. Eternal life is earned by sowing to the Spirit and preserving, persevering in good works. Eternal life has some parallel with physical life. Physical life is received as a gift, but then it must be developed. Children often develop to their full physical and mental ability under the auspices of their parents. In order for eternal life to flourish, we must also be obedient to our divine parent. When Paul says that we can reap eternal life by doing good, there is no inference at all that the life of love is characteristic of all who are saved, as neonomians claim. That's somebody that, that uh, 
you can put we'll talk about neonomies later. It's just too much going to right now. But Naomi's new and Nomos is law. For example, Don Garlington asserts the validity of our claims to be admitted into the eschatological kingdom will be weighed in the balances not of our talk, our verbal orthodoxy, but out of our love. And then it gives a reference for that. Rather like the faithful sheep of Matthew 25 who inherit a kingship in the future kingdom because of their acts of love, those believers in Galatia will reap an enhanced experience of eternal life if they do likewise. See discussion on sheep and goats. All right, so here it is about the neonomian. More recently, others have openly abandoned the conclusions of the Reformation and boldly assert that salvation is by works after all. In this, they are following Reformed theology to its logical conclusion. After revisiting passages such as Romans 2.13, the story of the rich young ruler, and references to enter the kingdom by means of work, these writers have concluded that Rome was partially correct. Justification has initial and final aspects, and both are sociological. The former depends on faith alone, and the latter on supposedly non-meritorious works that God produced in the believer. Salvation in this system is a process, not an event, and works are constituent and a, and a condition for final salvation. Of course, we reject that position. These viewpoints will be addressed throughout the book, Come on, Final Destiny, by Dillo. Some of the more recent advocates, such as Thomas Schreiner and Arda Abel Kennedy, the Ray State before us, a biblical theology perseverance assurance. Perseverance assurance survey proposal, Paul Rainbow, the way of salvation, role of Christian obedience and justification, and Alan Stanley, did Jesus teach salvation by works, the role of works and salvation in the synoptic gospels. So these are all books that are teaching this neonomian false stuff. Early on, this is seen as a threat to the Reformation. W.R. Godfrey notes, the much greater danger than antinomianism historically facing the Reformation balance of law and gospel has been moralism and legalism. Moralists or neonomians so stretch Christian responsibility that obedience becomes more than a fruit or evidence of faith. Rather, obedience comes to be seen as a constituent element of justifying faith. Legalism inevitably undermines Christian assurance and joy and tends to create a self-centered, excuse me, excessively introspective piety remarkably like medieval piety. Modern-day neonomians such as John MacArthur, John Piper, Paul Rainbow, Alan Stanley, and Thomas Schreiner share the belief that obedience is a constituent element of justifying faith. And so this quote was, um, the first part was from Godfrey, Law and Gospel, New Dictionary of Theology. In 2000. And here's the actual quote, I think. MacArthur, a neonomian advocate, expresses his theology this way. No, no, this is actually from Final Destiny. Salvation isn't the result of an intellectual exercise, it comes from a life lived in obedience and service to Christ as revealed in the scripture. It's the fruit of actions, not intentions. There's no room for passive spectators. Words without actions are empty and futile. The life we live, not the words we speak, determines our eternal destiny. Salvation, he says, comes from and is the fruit of actions. Obviously, this is salvation by faith plus works, is what Dillo says. Okay, so I'm going into this book right here. This is actually written by Shiner. 40 questions about Christians and the biblical law. I don't agree with their conclusions, of course, but he brings up some issues that I think are important. In its Old Testament context, this verse reads, You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. We should observe that the verse addressed to those who belong to the Lord. So in other words, they're already saved. It's his understanding. Israel has been redeemed from Egypt and liberated by God's grace. Therefore, in context, the verse should not be construed as legalistic or as offering salvation on the basis of works. Israel's obedience is a response to God's gracious intervention on their behalf. What is the nature of the life promised in Leviticus 18.5? Moses is almost certainly speaking of life in the land. For the laws were given to the Israelites so that they would not follow the practices of the Canaanites and be expelled from the land. If we consider the narrative of the remainder of the Old Testament, this interpretation fits nicely. Israel was sent into exile because of failure to do the Lord's will. They were vomited out of the land because of their disobedience. Well, yeah, that's true, but. Mm. 
well, I'll save that comment for later. It is instructive to see where Leviticus 18.5 is cited in the remainder of the Old Testament. Ezekiel picks up the words of Leviticus 18.5 in chapter 20 as he rehearses the history of Israel. He emphasized the grace of God to the generation delivered from Egypt. Even though they were rebellious and turned to what is detestable, the Lord acted for his namesake and liberated them from Egypt. He then gave them his rules by which if a person does them, he shall live. We see again that the law was given in a covenantal context after God had saved the people from Egypt. Nevertheless, Ezekiel immediately turns to the rebellion of Israel. They rejected my rules by which if a person does them, he shall live. In context, it's clear that Ezekiel addresses the wilderness generation. And so he has in mind the sin with the golden calf and the many other sins that characterize the wilderness generation. Nevertheless, the Lord did not completely wipe out Israel for his namesake, though he punished the wilderness generation by not allowing them to enter the land of promise. Ezekiel thus far has repeated twice that those who keep his laws will live, suggesting that Israel was not able to keep God's commands. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that later. Such a reading is confirmed as the narrative continues. Ezekiel reiterates a third time the words of Leviticus 18.5. The children of the wilderness generation were disobedient to the law that promised life if kept, physical life. Again, the Lord had mercy in not destroying them altogether, though he threatened exile if their disobedience continued. The reference to exile confirms the interpretation suggested for Leviticus 18.5. Failure to keep the law will result in Israel's expulsion from the land. Ezekiel concludes his reuse of Leviticus 18.5 with a remarkable statement. Moreover, I gave them statues that were not good and rules by which they could not have life. Ezekiel does not mean that the content of the law is not good. His point is that the law was not good for Israel since Israel was unable to obey it and to gain life. I don't know if that's the right interpretation of that. If Israel had turned from wickedness and pursued goodness, she would find life. There he goes with the hypothetical argument for salvation, but I think it's about sanctification. As Ezekiel 18 repeatedly emphasized, but Israel's consistent unwillingness to do what the Lord commands reveals a problem with her heart that can be remedied only by the grace of God. Israel's only hope is the promise of the indwelling spirit, which will enable them to keep God's commands. So that makes it sound like he don't believe that the indwelling spirit existed even in that time. Ezekiel 20 then confirms the words of Vicks 18.5. Since Israel was unable to keep God's law, she was being sent into exile. Nehemiah rehearses Israel's history in Nehemiah 9, remembering how the creator God chose Abram and promised to give him the land and how he delivered Israel from Egypt and sustained them in the wilderness. He comments that the law given on Sinai contains rights, rules, and true laws, good statutes, and commandments. One second. Remarkably, Israel rebelled in the wilderness by desiring to return to Egypt and by making a golden calf. Still, the Lord showed his mercy on them for he preserved them in the wilderness and led them graciously into the promised land. Still, Israel continued to rebel in the land in the days of the judges. The Lord handed them over to their enemies when they cast their law behind their back and delivered them when they cried out for mercy. The illusion of Leviticus 18.5 occurred in Nehemiah 9.29 which recalls the repeated warnings to Israel. You, the Lord, warned them in order to turn them back to your law. Yet they acted presumptuously and did not obey your commandments, but sinned against your rules, which if a person does them, he shall live by them. What Nehemiah emphasizes in sign of Leviticus 18.5 is Israel's failure to live by them, uh, to keep God's law, and hence they were sent into exile. I conclude then that Nehemiah's use of Leviticus 18.5 fits with the meaning of the verse as it was originally given in Leviticus. The reference to Leviticus 18.5 in the Old Testament are instructive, for they call attention to Israel's failure to keep the law, even suggesting a moral inability to do what pleases God. The life in view relates to life in the land, and yet there is a suggestion as well that Israel's failure to obey indicates that they do not truly know God. They need the Holy Spirit and the new covenant to do the will of God. Israel's constant rebellion and failure to keep the law led to their being sent into exile, as both Ezekiel and Nehemiah attested in citing. Some Jewish traditions in the period sequestered to the New Testament understood Leviticus 18.5 as promising eternal life to those who keep the law. 
and you shall keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live by them as everlasting life. Targum Ankelos. And you shall keep my statutes and the order of my judgments, which if a man do, shall live in them. And the life of eternity in his position shall be with the just. Targum Pseudo, Pseudo Joseph, I, Joshua, I can't remember what the J is. And a thorough study uh, on my position shall be on the C. Of the 185 and Old Testament, Second Temple Judaism, Crescent Sprinkle shows that in some texts, the verses interpreted as requiring obedience for eternal life. Okay, so that's letting me know to get Crescent Sprinkle's arguments for there. And then Simon Gathercurl, which is one that uh, David uh, Peterson, I think, that, is that his name? David Preston, sorry, uh, mentioned in his presentation argues that an eschatological reading of Leviticus 18.5 is evident both in the New Testament and Second Temple Judaism. He rightly remarks there's an internal eternalization of that life that in its original context in Leviticus would have been understood in terms of lengthened life and prosperity of one's descendants in the nation as a whole. Okay, the interpretation of Second Temple Judaism is helpful for understanding Paul, for Paul clearly had eternal life in view and not just life in the land. Hence, he understands what is promised in Leviticus 18.5 typologically. As is often the case in the New Testament, the land promises become a type of life to come. In Galatians 3.12, Paul opposes any sort of combination of law and gospel, as if one were saved both by doing the law and believing in the gospel. Life is obtained only via the latter and not by the former, for no one is able to keep what the law demands. We also must interpret what Paul says in terms of redemption history. Now that Christ has come, forgiveness is granted only through his eternal sacrifice, and hence there is no room for forgiveness via the law. Other scholars have argued that the verse refers to Christ's obedience, but it's doubtful that Christ is in mind here. So I can see some issues here, like this makes it sound like there was two types of forgiveness, possibly two types of salvation. Even though that's not what the author is arguing, I can see how that could be twisted. Some argue that Paul corrects a misinterpretation of Leviticus 8.5 in both Galatians 3.12 and Romans 10.5, just as the rabbis often responded to a misinterpretation of one verse by citing others. But the misinterpretation view suffers from major defect. Elsewhere, Paul always cites an Old Testament text positively in advance his own argument, and we are lacking any clear evidence that he responds to a wrong understanding here. It is most likely then that Paul cites the Old Testament to advance his argument. Paul reads Leviticus 18.5, redemptive historically. Perfect obedience is demanded for those who place themselves under the law for the atonement provided by the Old Testament sacrifices no longer avails with the coming of Christ. Now I'm going to have to explain redemptive historically later on. Um, I got to come back to that. So what I'm doing right now is I'm just reading through and I'm kind of getting an outline in my mind. And probably in the next video, I'll kind of sketch out that outline. It's in my mind. Um, so this is about the Old Testament sacrifices provided by Old Testament sacrifices no longer avail with the coming of Christ. Perfect obedience is not demanding that one sins under the Sinai covenant for the law provided forgiveness via sacrifices to those who transgress. In Paul's view, however, the Sinai covenant is no longer in force. Hence, those who observe circumcision in the law to obtain justification are turning the back to clock salvation history. The coming of Christ spells the end of the Sinai covenant. Hence, those who live under the law must keep it perfectly to be saved. For in returning to the law, they are forsaking the atonement provided by Christ. Returning to the law is futile, however, for the sacrifice of the atonement under the Sinai covenant pointed ahead to the sacrifice of Christ. Therefore, animal sacrifices no longer provide forgiveness now that the definitive sacrifice of Christ has been offered. Some scholars have read the relationship between Romans 10, 5, 10, 6, and 8 as they both describe the life of faith. On this reading, the citation of Leviticus 18.5 and Romans 10.5 positively portrays the life of believers. Hence, those who trust in God keep the law. This interpretation should be rejected for the following reasons. First, it is unlikely that Paul would use the same verse negatively in Galatians 3.12, but positively in Romans 10.5, especially when we consider that the subject is the same in both contexts, righteous law versus righteous faith. Second, it seems impossible that Paul would speak positively of righteousness coming from the law. Righteousness in Paul is invariably by faith or through Christ, but never from the law. The parallel in Philippians 3 confirms this reading. 
Paul repudiates his own righteousness that comes from the law and rests entirely on the righteousness that is his thought through faith in Christ. Third, this fits with what we see regularly in Paul's theology. And this book elsewhere documents where faith in Christ is contrasted with doing as the pathway to a right relationship with God. Fourth, the interpretation of in and here fits with the context, Romans 9 through 10, 4. Israel did not attain righteousness by pursuing it through the law, which Israel attempted to establish her own righteousness by works. They did not know about God's righteousness and attempt to establish her own through the obedience to the law. Summary. And, I, and I'm going to probably end it after this and start another video once I get that other outline done. Leviticus 18.5 in its Old Testament context requires obedience out of gratefulness to the Lord for delivering his people from Egypt. If Israel obeyed, they would remain in the land, but disobedience would lead to exile. Both Ezekiel and Nehemiah cite Leviticus 18.5 to remind Israel that their exile was due to their disobedience. Hence, it was clear from the Old Testament story that Israel was unable to observe the law. Some sectors of Second Temple Judaism picked up on Leviticus 18.5 and understood in terms of eternal life. Paul follows this pattern using the term typologically and contrasting life via the law of life versus life uh, uh, via faith. Clearly, Paul believes that attaining life by means of the law is impossible to the human disobedience. Eternal life is attained only by faith as believers trust in Christ and his sacrifice. Okay, and that's where I'll stop right now. I've got to give me some water. I'm in a hot room. Um, but anyway, if you're blessed by this video, um, subscribe if you haven't already. Hit the bell to get notifications so that you don't miss out on content. Uh, like it. If, uh, in other words, give it a thumbs up. Share it with others. And if you want to donate, if you've been blessed by this ministry, there'll be a link underneath the trailer video of this channel or perhaps underneath this one. God bless.